Hello, ladies and gentlemen, this is Luke Johnson. I'm back with Dr. Jonathan Cook as we talk about Harriet Beecher Stowe's Uncle Tom's Cabin. Uh, I'm really excited to talk about this text. I was able to do a fair amount of research beforehand, given that there were a number of articles in the public domain uh, from the JSTOR Early Journal content, and I've made those available to you on the Noetic Teaching Platform and app, so you'll be able to dive into those if you like. Um, Dr. Cook, I, I, I'd just like to start this session, I guess, by saying how much this book defied my expectations. Um, I had never read Uncle Tom's Cabin before, and uh, I think I had come to see it negatively without having any real knowledge of it. I think I, before reading it, I think I almost detested it because it's so outsold uh, writers like Hawthorne and Melville, I automatically assumed it was going to just be like some popular claptrap, but it's a really profound and beautiful novel. There were moments when I found myself weeping <laughs> during the reading of this. I mean, it was, and, and we'll get into a lot of the reasons why this was so emotionally moving for me, but I, I, I mean, I, I thought this was a breathtaking novel and I've enjoyed so many of the books that we've talked about before, but this one really touched me. I, I'll elaborate as we go throughout the interview, but I just wanted to say that, that this is a book I think everyone needs to read. Yeah. Um, I think uh, when people come to it, uh, they're surprisingly impressed with it. Um, they, uh, it used to be taught pretty regularly in high schools. I remember my older siblings read it, you know, in high school in the in the fifties, late fifties, sixties. Um, but it's kind of uh, it's had a real dramatic comeback in the academic world in the seventies and eighties uh, as a as a novel that was uh, written by a woman and became popular. Uh, because mainly because that kind of fiction was all the rage in the 1850s novels that uh, were so-called domestic fiction uh, written sanctifying the home and and paying uh, homage to the important role of women in society of guardians of, of moral probity um, but as far as the novel goes, I mean, it is very entertaining. Stowe really has a great command of character. She's got a great command of dialect, and she's sympathetic to all of her characters. She has a, a sort of compassionate view of, of, of all of her characters. Even her main villain, uh, you know, Simon Legree, is someone whom we can kind of understand, even though he turns out to be this nasty, you know, evil character who ends up killing Tom. So, uh, she was quite adept at characterization. She had a compelling story to tell. She was a passionate anti-slavery uh, mm -hmm. advocate, abolitionist. That was one of the things that struck me most about this text. And I, I'm sorry to interrupt, but I just yeah. want to make the point so I don't forget it. Is I think in retrospect, so many of us enlightened individuals take it for granted that there was so much correctness with the anti-slavery abolitionist perspective. But when you read Uncle Tom's Cabin, you realize how much of a zealous minority the abolitionists were. And that resonated with me um, because I kind of feel myself to be um, a little bit of a radical zealot about some issues that are very much outside the mainstream. And I, I guess I felt this communion with uh, with Harriet Beecher Stowe for that reason, and that eventually history sort of works its way out towards moral rectitude. But at the time, it was incredibly brave for her to do, be doing this because there were so many people violently opposed to, an to the anti-slavery movement. They were destroying printing presses and yeah. threatening to hang abolitionists. I mean, she really stuck her neck out there for this. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, she was living in Cincinnati uh, from, what, 1833 to 18. 49 and you know I Elijah Lovejoy had his printing press destroyed right. there and he was kind of an early martyr to uh, speaking up against slavery I, he was actually a friend of Stowe's uh, one of Stowe's older brothers 
so she really knew how uh, sort of dangerous could it could be to oppose slavery but you know she was a little safer as a woman in that capacity mm. um, and people kind of were shocked about the fact that here was this uh, wife of a um, professor and a minister you know Calvin Stowe who was uh, taking on this incredible role as a as an advocate uh, against slavery as as a woman you know because women were supposed to be uh, quiet and docile and obedient to their husbands and whatnot but here she was coming out so strongly I mean she she really didn't have much of a history of this before Uncle Tom's cabin she was raising her children in Cincinnati um, with with Calvin Stowe you know he was a professor there at the uh, local theological seminary that was run by Stowe's father um, and uh, she uh, you know she started writing short stories in the 1840s and some of them have slavery ele uh, anti-slavery elements to them but she really kind of grew her way into abolitionism and uh, Uncle Tom's Cabin just kind of exploded into her imagination yeah, she said it kind of. She said, one, yeah. yeah, right yeah. after the uh, the compromise of 1850, really set her off like a lot of Northerners because it was the fugitive slave law uh, that was part of the compromise that uh, enraged a lot of Northerners because it made it much easier to uh, bring slaves, uh, uh, make their renditions easier back to the South because uh, you got twice as much money if you were. Uh, in court, and it was a successful rendition than uh, than if you were w uh, testifying against a rendition. I mean, it was like something like ten dollars versus five dollars for witnesses, um, in terms of uh, the success of the case. So it was judicially biased in favor of the return of slaves, and Northerners felt that then they were now complicit with the South in upholding slavery because. They had to abide by whatever the you know whatever the South wanted. They couldn't if someone came to the the state of Massachusetts from the South, they could not say they were uh, safe from capture because they had made it to this kind of sanctuary um, uh, that 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 they, they couldn't do that anymore. And that enraged people like you know Thoreau, Emerson, Lowell, all the all the uh, some of the northern intellectuals, but it also enraged Stowe, who was then living in uh, in Maine at the time, because her husband had been appointed to be a professor at Bowdoin College. You know, she was living in New Brunswick, Maine. He actually went Bowdoin. at Bowdoin. Yeah, he he <laughs> arrived after she did. She went there with her kids, so she was there alone when she was uh, first inspired to write the book. And there's a famous anecdote about how she was in church in, in, in New Brunswick in the Congregational Church, and she had a vision at the altar taking communion of a slave being whipped to death. Really? She immediately went home and wrote down the scene in her uh, in a notebook and then started thinking about a novel that would you know, lead up to this climax of a slave being whipped to death. And of course, the slave was Uncle Tom, um, and so the novel supposedly fell into her imagination. She she always claimed that she had divine inspiration to write this book in early 1851, and she started serializing it for publication in June 1851, and that continued until uh, the following, I think roughly March, April 1852, which is when it was published um, by uh, William Jewett, who was a uh, New England publisher who uh, made a fortune off of this one book. Uh, she actually didn't make that good a deal with him, and he got a lot more money than he probably deserved by publishing it. Yeah, yeah. That I, I as you're at, you're bringing a layer of understanding to this text that I hadn't come across because a lot of the biographical materials I had encountered, uh, she frequently claimed that the book sort of wrote itself, that it was just kind of a culmination of her life experiences. Uh, but to talk about it as possibly divinely inspired, it takes it to a whole other level where she's having visions and yeah. and things of that well, nature. 
And it's I mean, and that's and that's the great thing about this. That's the other thing. I don't know if we'll talk about it. I mean, maybe it'll just sort of emerge organically. Maybe we shouldn't talk about it now. I don't know. But like what I thought was so amazing about this text was the <clears throat> one of the things I thought was so amazing about this text was this uh, this in, this ideological battle between empty, vacuous, um, dangerous uh, uh, Philistine sort of Chris Christianity yeah. versus the pure, passionate, authentic Christianity yeah. that, that, that Stowe and many of the slaves had and how that particular form of Christianity was really effective at the liberation of the slaves and how that culture uh, that that normalized status quo Christianity was something that was being used and twisted to justify the enslavement of black people and how you have that tension between this dull and this rich Christianity at, at, at the heart of these issues. Yeah. Yeah. And, that, it, it, the Bible is really central to her argument because she's contrasting, you know, I, I've written about this uh, elsewhere because the book, basically performs a repeated reenactment of the last judgment. I mean, if you read the book, you find so many allusions to judgment and books, the book of revelations and the scenes of crucifixion and resurrection. And uh, so being steeped in the Bible, the whole book is premised on the idea of uh, it's Matthew 25, 40, which is that, you know, whatever you do to the least of these, my brethren, you do unto me, right? Right. So however you treat the most lowly and disadvantaged uh, is a judgment on you as an individual morally, and it will also determine your posthumous fate. Well, yeah. well I think and, it's, uh, so, and, this, uh, and this is a really, really important lesson for Christians in America yeah. today. Yeah. Um, exactly. Yeah. Because I think so many modern American Christians have have accepted the status quo, have accepted the yeah. culture as well, is, and are forgetting about the the most radical ethical yeah. idealism of of the Christian message. Yeah. And but the at other, the same, yeah, the other thing the is, same, let me just uh, let me just yeah, mention sure. that the Philistine Christianity is is on perfect display in the sermon that Marie St. Clair reports back to Augustine, right? He doesn't go to church because he hates the Southern, you know, brand of Christianity, which is justifying slavery. Right. She comes back and says, I heard this wonderful sermon. And he says uh, that everyone should have their place in society so that it's a natural thing that slaves should be our servants because mm -hmm. that's the way God wanted it because he believes in a hierarchical society, right? right. And Augustine Sinclair is great because he makes all kinds of ironic comments about how, you know, we, we are so, um, the slaves really need to do it because we are so morally superior to them with all of our luxurious living and lying around on sofas and smoking cigars and drinking good wine. Um, so he himself is a, is a self-denigrating uh, illustration of the southern disillusioned slave owner who um, doesn't believe in the institution but feels helpless to do anything about it, right? Be even though he knows ethically well, it's wrong. Right, but he does have a conversion experience, and that's he a beautiful does, thing about yeah. it. Yeah, yeah, and that's, yeah. he goes from a sense of, of uh, helplessness to a real zeal about changing yeah. that situation. I, and we'll, we'll talk about this. I mean, I'll try to stick to the script a little bit more, but I think what's really great about reading this book is, and like so many great books, but maybe especially this one, is that it's not hard to apply the themes and motifs to the modern situation. And I think that's what's great for students who are studying this, is if we are to look at our own society, and it's like, do we have pernicious institutions or marginalized people that yeah. are in the same situation that were, was going on in the 1850s. And um, I think that could be a very provocative conversation on a philosophical and political level that could lead to some really invigorating conversations. So ju I, I'm just saying this should be justification yeah. why we ought to be reading this book in the yeah. high schools. Uh, definitely. I've taught it 
the last two years to my AP kids, and it generally goes over well. We learn yeah. a lot about American history and the institution of slavery, and and it's a good read as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, I'll I'll, I'll stop trying to hijack the conversation. I'm, just right. really, I'm really passionate about this book. So, um, I do. You, do you feel like we've covered enough of the biographical and historical circumstances? Yeah, just a couple of more uh, points. Sure. One is that um, not only was there the political influence of the um, uh, the fugitive slave law that was finally passed in September 1850, uh, but there was the incident of of Stowe losing her child, Sam Samuel right. Charles, right? right, Charlie who died of cholera in 1849 in Cincinnati, right? So cholera epidemic came to the U.S. in 1832 and then disappeared, and then it came back in 1849, and it uh, wasn't quite as bad as the first time in 1832, but it killed uh, people uh, in the main cities and then um, along the waterways of the Ohio and the Mississippi, right? So it came to Cincinnati killed her child, and she felt that she knew what it was like by losing that young child. Um, I think he was like two or three years old. He, uh, it made Stowe realize what it was like to have your child taken away from you if you were a slave mother. So she felt a personal identification with the slave mother and, and the loss of your child through legal means. That a slave owner could dispose of your family, right. could sell your husband, could... Or you, you weren't even allowed to get married, you know. You have these sort of de facto um, common law marriages with slaves, and, and you could just split families. That was the major criticism of the inhumanity of slavery, and that's one of the things that, you know, Stowe is attacking in, in the book. Um, and the other thing is she, one of her brothers had worked as a cotton factor uh, for a New Orleans uh, trading house. So... He uh, went up uh, to plantations for a year or so to collect debts um, from uh, plantation owners, and um, he was really Stowe's means of accessing information about what it was like to live on a plantation like Simon Legree's up in uh, rural Louisiana, up the Red River, because uh, otherwise Stowe had you know no experience of the South except a brief trip to into Kentucky uh, to visit the, one of her pupils, the family of one of her pupils, because she worked at, a, at an academy in Cincinnati. So uh, that was one of the major criticisms of the yeah. novel by Southern is that she, she was just basing her novel on hearsay. She really didn't know the South. Um, but the, the, the amazing thing is she, she knew the South as well as anyone could uh, who had read about it and heard personal anecdotes, and she had ex-slaves, escaped slaves working for her, and she talked to them in Cincinnati because a lot of them, you know, came across the Ohio, and so she had a lot, a lot of uh, verbal uh, communication about the institution of slavery in, in addition to her brother, so that's pretty much where she got her ideas. Well, even if, but the thing is, that's that was some of the the criticism I was reading in the biograph or in the historical biographical material is that, oh, she didn't understand the nuance of the institution of slavery and she was using stereotypes and that this was yeah. a propaganda piece that she was taking it all out of context. But like, you can't tell me that some of these stories weren't based in reality. And if any of them yeah. were true, it, yeah. it, it, even if that, even if any of these stories that were included in uncle Tom's story, uh, Uncle Tom's Cabin did occur, and yeah. even if they were a minority of situations, it still uh, it is an incredibly strong case for the termination yeah. for the institution of slavery. Yeah. I mean, even if it happened one time. Yeah. Well, you know, she one of her. I mean, she also had documentary evidence. She read Theodore Dwight Weld's uh, uh, Slavery as It Is um, in 1839, which Weld. He collected information from Southern newspapers for use. Um, he was working for, uh, you know, John Quincy Adams in Washington, um, who was trying to get rid of the gag rule about not being able to argue about slavery in Congress. So 
Weld collected, uh, he made a book out of all of these horrific um, stories about slave mistreatment right. um, and published it in 1839. Stowe read it carefully and um, she also read slave uh, memoirs, you know, um, uh, Thomas Bibb, Josiah Hansen, she read Frederick Douglass's narrative. Uh, so she had uh, slave, uh, fugitive slave or ex-slave's testimony of their experiences on plantations. And, and uh, you know, some actually one of them claimed to be the original Uncle Tom, and he made he made some money actually after the Civil War. Is, is uh, this the one? Is, is this the one in Indiana? Is this yeah, the I think it was yeah. in Indiana. I think it was Josiah Henson, uh, who was whose story was somewhat similar to Uncle Tom's in that he was so um, dedicated to his master that he was willing to go into the free state. Uh, I think it was Ohio, and to pay some money and then go back into slavery uh, without trying to escape and, and taking money and w along with him. So he was a totally uh, a dedicated slave who was loyal to his master, just like uh, Uncle Tom is loyal to Mr. Shelby and refuses to run away when um, he sold to uh, Haley, the slave trader in the beginning of the novel. You know. Well, you, you know what's interesting is that these more ghastly episodes uh, that Harriet Beecher Stowe picks out, such as, you know, the death of Uncle Tom and how dramatic that is. I'm not even sure if that's the worst part about the institution of slavery. It, if the, it's, it's the duller, less dramatic episodes where everybody is kept in a state of ignorance and dependence and servileness. It's, it's a, it's a crime against humanity to not, at least, at, uh, this is the, I would have been an abolitionist. It's a pretty obvious that if I had been alive, alive, yeah. alive at that time, I would have been a, a zealot abolitionist, but just, um, well, some of the, a couple of how the work. Uneducated, how uneducated the, 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 how yeah. uneducated the slaves were and how they weren't taught very simple things. And, and yeah. even though they may not have been beaten, to be deprived of a modicum of the education that the white people had, I, I just, I find that to be a crime against humanity when they could have easily done it. There were so many people around to, to teach them how to read and read the Bible and do, and read other yeah. things. Well, of course, Nat Turner, 1831 in Southampton, Virginia, you know, led the most deadly slave revolt uh, of the 19th century, killed somewhat, I, I think, upwards of 60 whites. And the uh, excuse for uh, banning black education was, you know, um, Nat Turner was well versed in the Bible. He was well read. He was a prophet. Um, and they thought, well, this is what happens if you educate a slave. He's going to uh, look. He's either going to develop, um, you know, be better organizational skills to lead a revolt, or he's going to look at the Bible and start pointing to the Old Testament and saying, uh, "Let my people know, go." This is what you got? Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. And there's a sense of dignity that comes with that too, right? If you're just like, I can, I can reason and write and talk just yeah. as well as the white man. You start to see. Yeah. There's like, there's no difference. Well, there's no, no material. I mean, there's no, there's no real difference between you and I. We're just well, shades of skin tone. Uncle Tom, though, is given the opportunity to learn to read. Right? Remember, up in the, right. Shel the Shelby plantation, George Shelby, the son, um, helps him with his reading skills. He reads aloud from the Bible. Uh, he 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 does that again with Eva St. Clair in New Orleans, um, where he is reading together with her. So. This is the mild, more tolerant form of slavery that Stowe um, acknowledged could exist in the South, but there was always the threat of sale in the background, right? Just like yeah. Mr. Shelby has to sell slaves because he gets into debt. Augustine St. Clair's slaves have to be sold because he dies in a, in a barroom brawl and his wife is too callous to, to care to uh, you know, either liberate or find a kindly master for for the slaves of the household to go to, like like Tom, that's why he ends up with Simon McGree. Right, right. Well, and that that's and I, I don't know. The, the the other thing that bugged me that bugs me about Uncle Tom's Cabin, or maybe just the name Uncle Tom. Yeah. Like I hear the 
that thrown around as a <laughs> pejorative, pejorative uh, term. Yeah. Yeah. But, but uncle Tom to me as a Christian is, is a heroic figure uh, yeah. to me, to Luke Johnson. I don't know what you think about it, but to me, he does imitate Christ in the sense that he will do, he will not, not, not unlike the slaves on the on the plantation, like Sambo and the other individuals who've been given a taste of power, so they can subjugate yeah. the other slaves and stuff like that. He refuses to do wrong, and he suffers great consequences for it, and eventually dies. Right? Like, yeah. In, in the entire time while he's doing this, he's giving a testimony that it's his faith in Jesus Christ that allows him to endure to endure these trials and tribulations. Mm -hmm. And then ultimately, that is a contribution politically and spiritually towards the emancipation of slaves, because you can see that in the, yeah. in, in the conversion of, of St. Clair. Like after, after that happens, right, he, he pledges his life to the anti-slavery cause. And I think this, this is why I love this text so much, because it shows how Christianity can really, um, how it really ought to be evolved in political movements and not not like we've talked in other situations where there's this um, dominionism, this sort of uh, uh, manifest destiny with Christianity, but more about looking out for the weakest of society. And that's, that's so Uncle Tom to me is not some sort of servile, yes, master, yes, master, I'll do whatever you say. Like he yeah. ultimately ends up in a, in his own way, helping to defeat the institution of slavery. Yeah. He's a major player in that. Yeah. Well, I think the term Uncle Tom developed a pejorative meaning for African Americans uh, in the early 20th century because they'd seen Stowe's novel. Um, they knew it more from its post-Civil War reputation when it was the subject of all kinds of traveling shows, minstrel shows, uh, entertainments, and uh, so the, the anti-slavery element had gotten uh, cheapened, or even, uh, there are even pro-slavery versions of Aunt Uncle Tom's Cabin, a dramatic rewrite, so, yeah, it, you know, it, yeah. it, and he became caricatured as the subservient black man, because that is the easiest way to look at him, you, you know, it means ignoring the message of the novel which is you know a passionate depiction of him as a as a principled human being um superior to everyone around him um and and it also led to a change in his character because the general public thought of him as an older guy who was sort of uh, verging on uh, you know sort of a grandfatherly figure rather than being a virile a guy in his 30s who had several children with Chloe, you know, his wife, and uncle and aunt were just sort of, those were the terms that were used uh, as affectionate um, uh, endearments to slaves who were part of the household, right? So uncle and aunt doesn't mean anything. No one's uncle and aunt. It was just an affectionate term for a, a sort of household surrogate who was, happened to be a slave as well. And uh, so the, this, the caricature of Uncle Tom uh, in the 20th century was based on reaction to the cheap commercialization of Stowe's fiction in these dramatic forms, in these traveling shows that, I mean, you just can't believe the, what happened after the Civil War because you would have these uncles, hundreds and hundreds of these traveling shows who were reenacting Uncle Tom's Cabin in all kinds of forms so is this is where like a lot of blackface and stuff came. Yeah, into play? some of them do in minstrel yeah. uh, uh, array, and some of them with elephants and lions. I mean, it's almost like a circus yeah. combined with Stowe's novel because it became such a uh, phenomenal. You know what? Event. I should I should go back. I was telling Dr. Cook off the air. Uh, I, there, I recorded all the primary source materials that I could find in the JSTOR early journal content, except for one, it was a court case. And I, I'm starting to think now that the court case was more about how Stowe lost control of the characters when they entered yeah. into the public domain. And I think yeah. she, I think, I don't know if you have anything on this, but I think the permutation, she may have even been able to see some of the permutations where they were bastardizing the character of uncle Tom. And I think she was really upset by it, but 
I guess I, I think the court ruled that people were allowed to do this. You know, yeah, like once I mean, you, you release them into the world. You could pretty much uh, do whatever you wanted with her story um, as a, as a, in a dramatic form. Do you know if she saw that? Do you know? Um, I think she uh, actually allowed one uh, black actress to perform Uncle Tom's Cabin herself as a sort of solo uh, performer in uh, in the theater, but. In Stowe's world, in this evangelical evangelical Christian world, women were really not supposed to go to the theater, which which still had a bad reputation as being the, the um, uh, you know that place where prostitutes would hang out on the upper levels, and where cheap entertainment was uh, was on uh, tap, and and so she really did not see much of uh, these. I guess you call them bastardizations. I mean, there was one Uncle Tom's adaptation that that did uh, that was tried to be pretty faithful to the book uh, fairly soon after it came out, and that that had a, a pretty long run um, in New York and other major cities. But there were uh, you know other versions that came out, including um, one that that had a sort of pro-slavery bias to it. Um, so after the Civil War, there was less need for the country to uh, uh, somehow um, find a way to get rid of slavery, right? So they could look back on the novel and heighten its caricature, you know, try to caricature the black characters there by depicting the sort of minstrel performers because abolition had already happened, right? And now there was a... a um, Re, a reaction from the South that was uh, amounted to the idea that, you know, yes, we had to liberate our slaves, but that didn't mean that we would give them rights or treat them as human beings. We would still segregate them and discriminate against them and kill them once in a while with lynchings. Um, so it was really, uh, it was a, a very different world after the Civil War for the novel, but the novel itself had a huge impact on um, white northern white audiences that put them into a, a frame of mind that was much more uh, critical of slavery than they would have ever been, you know, because they never went to an abolitionist lecture, right? They wouldn't do that, but they would stay home and read Uncle Tom's Cabin and be persuaded by her argument. So the the uh, number of people who were sympathetic to abolitionism increased steadily after her book was published beyond the, the narrow confines of the of the official movement it's, it's really incredible how a book can do that just a little bit yeah. of information and a little bit of a argument that gets put out there um i think we're seeing that today in some ways um w what was really interesting also about this book is that it it, it wasn't unilateral it wasn't a unilateral critique of the southern slaveholders it was also a critique yeah of the north which i thought to be a really profound wrinkle that i never really thought of before um because the the north the northerners could quite easily condemn the institution of slavery but they weren't really looking in the mirror and asking themselves what they could do to be part of the solution they weren't really you know before yeah. the civil war they weren't really asking themselves well are we prepared to hire uh, uh, slaves that escape? Are we prepared to educate slaves that escape? Or if there were a massive em emancipation, uh, do we have the institutions in place to suddenly take care of four million, is, is that is that right, four million uh, new citizens? More like three three million, I think. Three, or, or something like, something to that yeah. effect. Yeah. And so, you know, it's very easy in some ways to, to, to look at the South and be like, you're doing everything all wrong. Yeah. Like, what I thought was really successful about Stowe's novel was she's like, yo, North, you got some stuff you need to clean up, too. Yeah, yeah, that's at the end of the book where she has a little chapter that is a, a sort of prophetic uh, uh, reflection about the sins of the whole country, not just right. the, the South. But, yeah, that's a good point because you see that 
uh, illustrated, first of all, the, the fact that Simon Legree came from Vermont originally, right? He was a northerner who went to sea as a sailor and then became corrupted and then ended up in the South as a slaveholder and a, and a plantation owner. And also um, uh, Augustine St. Clair's sister, I'm sorry, her cousin, the cousin who was living in his household, uh, who um, becomes kind of the protector of Topsy after Augustine's death, right? Uh, she, uh, Augustine criticizes her for being from a era, from a region of the country that believes in abolitionism, but doesn't really uh, think well of African Americans and, and refuses yeah. to, you know, touch them or shake hands with them or be close to them physically. Yeah, so, I think there was, I think there was an episode where it's like, you'll kiss your dog, but you won't yeah. kiss a black. Something like that. Yeah. yeah. So that's a, a telling criticism uh, of her. And um, so, yeah. Well, that, we, we, should yeah. Stick to, we should stick to your, to your, your the, no, the questions that are more rooted in the specifics of the novel. I yeah. have all these major like, philosophical questions I want to ask about it. But uh, you mentioned something about there being a, a double plot, the novel. Yeah, I mean, because the, the book is uh, so effective in giving you a very broad exposure to the realities of slavery and and the situation of slaves, um, you have, I mean, we start out on a plantation in Kentucky, the Shelby's, and then um, we immediately are uh, launched into the following Eliza Harris's escape with her child, Harry, uh, because of the threat to him, the child, to go along with, uh, to be thrown in with Uncle Tom as um, the, the, uh, the amount of money that was owed to Haley has to be made up somehow. And so Uncle Tom and this child will be uh, sold as slaves. So Eliza escapes and she knows that her husband, George, has already uh, vowed to run away. And both of them are going to be making their way up to Canada, right? So that's going to be one storyline. And then the other storyline is the story of Tom being sold down the river, so to speak. With Haley, who's going to take him on riverboats down the Ohio and then down to New Orleans. So, you know, you sort of have this this movement uh, of characters going north and south. Um, the northern-headed uh, characters have a much more exciting story initially because they're being chased as fugitives, right? And they're given assistance for, to people up in Ohio, and they eventually make it to the shores of uh, Lake Erie and then are going to take a boat across to Canada because that was the refuge for a lot of uh, fugitive slaves who thought that they wouldn't be safe staying in even in northern states after the fugitive slave laws were passed. But So we see Eliza with her child and this was a famous scene in the right. melodramas that um, were made uh, of the story. You know, she crosses the Ohio River when it's Mm. Ice flows are going in uh, in March, early March, I think it is late February, and uh, she gets to the other side, and she ends up in the household of a uh, Senator Byrd and his wife, and he has recently been involved in some legislation. He's a state senator, not a national senator. He's been involved in legislation in Columbus, Ohio, uh, regarding the status of fugitive slaves. And, uh, and now he has a slave on his doorstep, you know, who's needing uh, assistance and care and help to continue uh, traveling north. And then she ends up with the Halliday family who were Quakers. And that sect, of course, is famous for their abolitionist viewpoints. Uh, so we learn a little bit about the Quaker attitude towards abolitionism and you have this, you know, beautiful image of a motherly Quaker, Rachel Halliday. You know, her name Halliday is a disguised form of the word holiday, right? Yeah. In other words, a holy day. She's a holy figure, um, and she provides sanctuary for Eliza and and reunites Eliza with her husband, uh, George Harris, who has made it up there as well. So, and then in the meantime, you have Uncle Tom going down the river. 
Uh, he on this riverboat, we have some interesting scenes about Haley um, dealing with um, uh, making deals regarding slavery. And there's a slave mother named Lucy who's child who's tricked onto the boat, and then her child is taken from her when she is not aware of it. He's sold to be taken uh, at the next stop uh, of the riverboat uh, in um, in Kentucky. And uh, a lot, uh, Lucy jumps off the ship in uh, despair at losing her child. And there's some very uh, poignant language that Stowe used about how this mother, slave mother, is just so distraught at the loss of her child that she commits suicide, and you know, how just how despairing this is, and how she will, uh, you know, be rewarded in heaven. She will have a comforter in Jesus. Um, so it's on this trip that Uncle Tom goes down to New Orleans. He meets the St. Clair family. Augustine St. Clair buys him because he had rescued. Eva from uh, falling in the river accidentally, and he jumps in and saves her. So he comes recommended as a sort of heroic figure, and then enters their household. And he he is um, he's not really the center of attention for a while. Augustine Saint Clair becomes the the focus there because he is uh, put in the position of a, a reluctant slave owner, which you know there were a few of them in the South, not that many. And he's quite a fascinating figure, um, and he debates with his, actually his brother, um, who runs the, the family plantation, because when the parents died, he uh, decided he didn't want to run the plantation. He'd rather live on the fruits of uh, the income and live in New Orleans with a few slaves in his household and be a man of leisure, and his brother Adolf would... Uh, would be the um, the guy who kept the business going that his father started, right? Um, and uh, so they debate about slavery in a way that is very contemporary for the late 1840s. They talk about, <clears throat> you know, the European revolutions of 1848, how t uh, people <clears throat> in the underclass were stirring, not only black but white. I mean, wh white Europeans were rising up against their their uh, virtual imprisonment in industries uh, and uh, politically as well. So we get some very interesting um, panoramic views of European American history from the period uh, in these discussions between Augustine and his cousin. I'm sorry, his brother, rather. Uh, but then Uncle Tom is sold when Augustine dies, and he ends up with Simon Legree, so there we're back with Uncle Tom as a focus of attention and seeing Legree's sadistic treatment of him is a, is a very powerful statement about slavery at its worst. Right. So you're kind of going down to hell as the deeper you go into in the, in the south, <clears throat> ending up on a rural Louisiana plantation. And then you're going north as though you're rising up into heaven into freedom. And the river, uh, the Ohio River, is kind of the Canaan between the Promised Land of the North and the and the Hell of the South. So it's it's a sort of biblical geography. You know? Right, right. We, you know, so this all this um, prompts a larger question, and I wonder if you could just field it for a second. Um, I've been I told I told Doctor Cook off air that I've been working on this primary source text, Battles and Leaders of the Civil War. And just so I can get my head around the time period, when you have a text like Uncle Tom's Cabin out there, and it is igniting this debate and these passions about uh, these, this dialect, these dialectical passions of pro-slavery and anti-slavery and things like that. But then on the other hand, so many Civil War historians will say that the Civil War itself was not fought over the slavery issue and the Emancipation Proclamation didn't change anything about the war. But that's hard for me to believe when you have a book like this resonating with so many people that the Civil War, I mean, when, pe I mean, when people voted for Lincoln, they knew they were essentially 
voting for secession and a likely civil war, didn't they? I mean, well, no, all this had to be in the atmosphere, right? I mean, how how could the civil war have not been about slavery with this book as part of the national conversation? Yeah. Well, first of all, no reputable historian, you know, would ever believe that the civil war wasn't based on slavery. I mean, the South after this, well, during the civil war and afterwards made a concerted effort to recast the conflict as over states rights because they did not they did not feel proud of the institution of slavery i mean they they defended it uh, they were uh, aggrieved um when lincoln was elected but they um it was all sort of political they didn't they didn't want people thinking that the whole basis of their nation state was the degradation of other human beings. They 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 wanted to believe that you know it was their rights that they were defending, okay. and so they were trying to put a positive spin on it. And everyone who repeats that line is obviously trying to whitewash the history of uh, well, that, times in the Civil War. So no, it doesn't make any sense. And well, that frustrates me so much because that's what we're fed. In at least that's what I was fed. In, in 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 my yeah, high school southern, education, yeah, yeah, and 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 okay. I think that's what you're fed on a lot of like you know a lot of uh, documentaries and things like that. That is something that's repeated very often that the Civil War was not about slavery. I'm like, well, like hell it wasn't. <laughs> like hell it wasn't. It just, it just ties into the whole controversy about all these monuments, right? What to do about these yeah. monuments around the south to all these confederate leaders and you know how they were nobly uh they fought the war nobly and they deserve to be honored well a lot of these monuments were specifically um, put in place long after the war mainly to intimidate african americans they weren't there to honor the mm. generals and whatever they were there to sort of say hey even though we lost the war we still have these great people who fought the North, and by the way, you know you should you should uh, be afraid of us because you know we're very good soldiers, yeah. and uh, we have power over our black population now. Um, now that the Yankee invaders are gone, um, mm. so I mean, there's a very clear Southern bias that you can find, I guess, still. I mean, in yeah. Yeah. Not, not, not necessarily in academia. I mean, you really would not find any American historians, even Southern American historians, who, who would have the, the uh, hypocrisy to repeat that line. But there is a big disjunction between informed people and those who kind of reflect the popular myths of their of their time and their place. You know, because Southerners, you know, will still repeat the same lines that they were saying in the you know after the civil war you know yeah, yeah. Camp, religion of the lost cause right that yeah. that religion is still around yeah um if you read tony horowitz's confederates in the attic which is a wonderful book from about 20 years ago a very entertaining account of the legacy of the civil war yeah it just shows how how hard it is for mythologies to die <laughs> yeah it, exactly. it, it, i mean like you know yeah i you know i live in virginia and it was and it was the seat of the confederacy but where i live the county where, our, where we live are the county split in two right you know how yeah uh, it was like, yeah well you had you had yeah you had you had anti-slave uh, people but yeah um but the the the, uh, the fact is you know when lincoln was elected no one really imagine that the South would have the audacity to follow through on their threats. I mean, Lincoln was clearly opposed to slavery, but it was still a toss up whether all of these fire eaters would, uh, would get their way because they were not, uh, I mean, they were very vocal, but there were a lot of unionists in the South who, who were disturbed by the idea of uh, secession, but they, they kind of, um, um, you know they lost out, and, and um, secession happened. Anyway, let's get back to our book. Sure, sure, sure. Um, let's see here. Uh, I, I mean, should we talk a little bit more? I mean, I 
she doesn't have she's not in the book very long but eva st Clair was a really remarkable yeah. character and yeah casting exactly. it one yeah i i, I mean you was saying i mean how do you not uh i mean i you know eva is the one that forms this incredible relationship with uncle tom and yeah and <laughs> She's yeah. this. She's this cherub from another world that isn't yeah. here long, and she imparts these great moral lessons. And I don't know. Um, yeah, I, six years I, old, six or seven have, years old. <laughs> I have I, I have nieces, and so I I kind of hope that my nieces are yeah. are like Eva St. Clair in some way. I mean, they, Eva St. Clair is. Uh, I mean, she, there's just so much. Um, purity of love to her you know yeah, yeah. And she, she i mean she's an ideal she's yeah. an ideal character and she's <clears throat> she's really the product of the sentiment and sentimentalization and idealization of children that was typical of antebellum culture but also uh found in the bible in the the millennial visions of isaiah you know right. isaiah 11 where uh, isaiah 11 uh, you know the 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 lamb and the lion shall lie down together. A little child shall lead them. So, the idea of having the pure child who is immune to evil because she transcends it somehow with her character uh, really um, is formulated uh, with those ideas behind her. And of course, her death is a rival to uh, Charles Dickens' old curiosity shop, Little Nell. You know that everyone cried over in uh, the early 1840s. I may, I may have cried when she died. I may have cried. <laughs> yeah, so it's a, it's, a, it's a very touching scene. I mean, you, you know, a lot of people sort of hold their nose. They think they have to hold their nose when they read that death scene, but it is very moving. And there are all kinds of uh, echoes of Christianity of her as, as the suffering <clears throat> little child who, who exhibits uh, Christ-like tendencies and has to die for the sins of her of her uh the taking on the sins of, of uh, other people you know the south and uh it's her image that that provides tom with his uh as a reminder of his ethical idealism when he's facing right. the tortures and torments of simon legree you know right. he thinks of her when <coughs> legree is whipping him and he's inspired to hold out against this evil man, you know, to keep his idealism <coughs> because of, of the virtual martyrdom that um, Eva herself faced, you know, dying of tuberculosis at a young age. She's, she's not being tortured by someone, right. obviously. Right. Um, <clears throat> but her, the death scene is, is filled with biblical references. And if you read, uh, <clears throat> Read it carefully. You'll find references to, especially the Gospel of John. You know, oh and, yeah, and the bridegroom oh, yeah. coming at night is the allusion to the, you know, well, Christ. She, Matthew yeah. is the, uh, <clears throat> the the heavenly bridegroom coming. And she um, gives, and she gives, and she gives Uncle Tom hope <clears throat> for the New Jerusalem. And, and yeah, the, uh, and yeah, they were together if, from the apocalypse. Yeah, from the yeah, from the Revelation. I just I don't know if it was the death scene that caused me to weep so much as it was to think of this little girl, this hulking big yeah. black man yeah. sitting down and, and their best buds, you know. <laughs> and then yeah, being the closest of friends and reading the Bible together and reading no like you said, reading apocalyptic literature together and not being afraid of it, but seeing it as this um blessed hope for both of them. Yeah. And yeah, you, you, that's just not something you encounter today. You know, it's not it's not something you see. That, yeah, well, you and, see it, you know, in Shirley Temple movies. I guess. Uh, but yeah, it's amazing because uh, both of them are very uh, evangelical. I mean, Eva's right. name, Eva, Eveline, uh, Saint Clair. So the the name suggests the evangels ex ex expresses the idea of Eve as the mother of humanity right so she has this kind of dual identity as <clears throat> embodying the <clears throat> the evangelical uh christian ideal of conversion and also eve as the original 
mother of humanity, you know, the unfallen Eve, of course. Or, um, yeah, so um, her name, you know, most of the names in the book, or a lot of the names in the book have these symbolic resonances. Like Cassie, you know, you think of Cassie as the discarded mistress of uh, Simon Legree, who tells this horrific story about <clears throat> being the mistress of, you know, she's a mulatto, and she's been the mistress of, uh, of several white men, and each of them kind of for one reason or another pass her off uh, to the next one as she gets more and more children until she actually kills one of her children out of fear that it will be, uh, you know, facing the same kind of horrible life that she has as a slave. But she turns into a, um, a nemesis figure when she is um, able to leave um, Legree's plantation with her protege Emmeline, right, who is also threatened with sexual slavery to Legree because he's become apparently jaded and tired of Cassie, who's a very strong-willed woman. Well, of course, Cassie's name comes from the, the Greek, uh, the Tro Trojan uh, prophetess Cassandra, right, mm. who warned about the fall of Troy. Mm. And <clears throat> so Cassie is um, uh, sort of there to warn about the end of Legree's control and a kind of extended warning to the South that uh, your time is coming uh, because of your injustices. Uh, so Cassie is, um, she's a, you know, she's a fallen woman. She's kind of a Magdalene figure as, a, as the mistress uh, of uh, Legree, um, but she she is able to escape with Emmeline through this very clever ruse of pretending to leave and then doubling back and going back to the house and then living in the attic of Legree's mansion and then haunting him with all kinds of supernatural yeah, tricks. Yeah. Taking advantage of his, <laughs> his superstition and his tendency to drink because the guy was going to bed drunk a lot and he yeah, was susceptible to being persuaded that the house was haunted because he apparently there's there's a hint that he may have tortured a slave to death in the attic uh, so he himself um, has this on his conscience apparently and he dies it's a little bit ambiguous about how he actually dies but he actually dies of uh, you know of delirium tremens uh, because of his drink uh, which is actually a, a big uh, favorite cause of um, Harry Peacher Stowe's father, Lyman Beecher, was his. Uh, he published a famous book of temperance lectures, um, and so temperance, you know, uh, not <clears throat> drinking, um, was a message that uh, is implicitly conveyed in the characterization of Legree. Yeah. As a, well, as a I, 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 assume, I assume that he died of cirrhosis or something like that. I don't know what delirium tremens even is. Well, do, you know, it, it's the condition of um, being um, uh, saturation with alcohol. You, it's sort of a oh. mental, a period, a temporary mental uh, impairment based on alcohol poisoning. Oh, okay. Yeah. yeah. But it's different from alcohol poisoning because I guess it affects the mind yeah. more than the body. Yeah. Yeah, it's uh, I don't, I think it's still around. It's uh, characteristic of heavy drinkers. Uh, if they overdo it, uh, sometimes they can uh, just go crazy and have all kinds of visions and uh, push themselves to to death at some point. Wow. Um, <clears throat> so that's that's that's. Uh, Cassie's name, uh, and also the name uh, um, Simon Legree. Actually, uh, Harry Peter Stowe kind of got it from Le Garre. It was a French name. Hugh Le Garre was a southern uh, politician, and he wasn't happy about having his name used to uh, be the basis for her villain, and he, he expressed that. Uh, but Legree is, a, is not anything that transparently allegorical, uh, unlike... Uh, you know, Cassie. Uh, there's also an interesting association with the name George, because George Shelby <clears throat> is the son of the original owner who comes down to 
arrive with the money to buy Tom back, um, to buy him his freedom, uh, as he was promised uh, when he was sold to Haley in the beginning of the novel. And George Shelby is the son of Tom's original owner, and he arrives just after Tom's death, claims the body, and actually knocks Haley down when he makes some nasty remarks about, you know, Tom's, um, you know, he was, he was sort of surprised that George Shelby was interested in retrieving Tom's body because for Tom, for, for uh, Legree, he's just a dead Negro. Uh, but anyway, the name George for George Shelby and George Harris, of course, is the slave um, mulatto who escapes north with his wife, Eliza. Um, you know, the championship of the name George, of course, ties in with the idea of George Washington as as the nation's hero. So it's it's got a positive valence based on the association with our, you know, founding father. Right. <clears throat> so, so I, I take it that, you know, just trying to get back in time here, that this is considered a novel of domesticity. Yeah. Um, yeah, we talked about that at the beginning. It, it was, uh, that's the reason it sold so phenomenally because domestic novels were really um, the best sellers of the time. Because uh, Stowe's novel, it sold 300,000 copies the first year and then this kept selling and selling and it turned into the historic bestseller of the 19th century. But before that, there was a novel called Wide Wide World um, a domestic novel from, um, I think, a year before. Does that just mean by domest a domestic novel just means that it's something that women were just eating up? Is that what that yeah. means? Yeah, well, domestic means it's written by women for women. Uh, why, is this, why is this a women, woman's book? Um, I mean, I guess the answer should be obvious, but it's also not obvious to me. Why, well, why, why would we even consider it a woman's book? Well, because it's written by a woman and it glorifies this home as a sanctuary, specifically Uncle Tom's Cabin. The very name of the book is based on his cabin as a place where Tom and Chloe and their children were happy and singing hymns together and reading from the Bible and having some good food. So it idealizes the home as a sanctuary from the corrupt values of the marketplace. So the home is the place where women rule. You know, there was a very segregated idea about the role of women men and women. And domesticity was the ideal for women because they were in charge of the education of the children. They were in charge of cooking. They were in charge of management of the home. But it was a home that was a, a source of values of, um, you know, love and humanity and affection for your family so, so the so you know was it, so was it very unusual for a man to read this book at the time uh no i mean everyone read it but it was designed i mean it was a combination of the fact that it was it was a, a topical book that everyone was thinking about at the time slavery right but right. also a novel that women could read and they would have their heartstrings pulled. So right. the idea of you know crying over the death of little Eva or the 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 the, the threat to Eliza escaping over the ice. Right. These were uh, things that specifically appealed to women readers because they touched on women's issues. Also, you have very strong female characters like Eliza rescuing her child, insisting she's going to save her child and, and escape before she would let it uh, be sold uh, with Tom to the slave trader Haley. Uh, Cassie, a strong uh, mulatto woman who uh, commands Legree's uh, will. He, she has kind of power over him. Um, uh, and he's afraid of her because she has such a strong willpower. Um, so you have you have uh, issues with women who are strong characters who are resisting the moral degradation of slavery. You know, Cassie is protecting Emmeline from Simon Legree's clutches, and 
and the and, and of course um, Eva Sinclair is, is the perfect you know female child um, so all of these uh, figures sort of glorify domesticity plus Augustine Sinclair's household you have the Dinah the cook you know whose kitchen is a total mess but she knows where everything is so you have a kind of humorous glorification of Dinah's ability to cook the most amazing meals for the household um, and uh, so his, his household is run in a sort of uh, very benevolent manner even though his servants are some of them are stealing his clothes uh, and his cook is you know putting all kinds of odds and ends in the drawers where they shouldn't be uh, so there's a humorous depiction of the domestic ideal with Augustine Sinclair. Also, Rachel Halliday, the Quakeress that Eliza and George Harris flee to, is a another, yet another depiction of a home as a sanctuary where people are protected, they feel safe, they can have these delicious meals and kind of, you know, when Eliza has a tea with her husband, George, and Rachel Halliday, it's almost like a communion. If you read the language, it's almost like they're having Holy Communion, drinking their little tea together. Um, so all of this consistently glorifies women and, and their role as guarantors of moral values, just like Mrs. Bird, the senator's wife, insists that they take in Eliza, right, and give her the clothes that they have left over from her son's clothes uh, to Eliza's son, um, which uh, um, shows that they are sympathizing with that message of helping even the lowliest, most needy people. So that's why it's, a, it's considered a, a domestic novel. Of course, Stowe went on to write other novels that, um, you know, usually sold well, and, you know, she had a later reputation as a, as a domestic novelist who, who fit into this uh, this genre of women's right, writing, which is now so, you know, championed in academia because it was neglected for a long time before this. Right. So, you know, we've covered a lot of the, the societal factors, a lot of the virtues of the text that made this a bestseller and so influential. Um, did we leave anything out as a possible explanation about why this skyrocketed and had such an effect on the American psyche? Um, no, I think we've covered most of it. It's uh, there's there's just I think what what you get from reading the book is there's a very strong feeling of sympathy of the characters. There's a real humanitarian feeling that comes through from reading this book. And there's some real humor as well. Uh, even humor that is based on minstrel show stereotypes. Some of the black characters uh, who are uh, on the Shelby plantation are uh, repeating jokes that you'd find in the minstrel shows of the time. Um, so it's got it's got this, uh, you know, the, the value of the book is it presents a sort of encyclopedic view of slavery and American history at a particular time in, say, the 1840s or early 1850s. Um, and that's why after uh, the Civil War, John DeForest actually considered it as the great American novel. That term was actually invented. Mm. Uh, by John DeForest in an article for the uh, Nation magazine, and his first candidate for the Great American Novel was uh, uh, Uncle Tom's Cabin. Huh. I mean, so he invented the term, and he and he and he suggested that was the book that fit it. Although he wasn't saying that other books couldn't aspire to that that uh, merit uh, as well. You've talked a little bit about the afterlife of this novel in regards to our, our modern contemporary context. But what about, you know, 20, 30, 40, 50 years after its release? Yeah. What, what about that? I don't know if we've talked about that as much. Well, it, as, as we said, it had an amazing afterlife in drama, uh, 
at least two or three different dramatic adaptations were were going uh, within a couple of years and and after the civil war it was revived again um as a popular entertainment uh, but it was also commercialized and you had all kinds of commercial uh, adaptations so that you had figurines of uncle tom or eva um you had uh, you know, placemats and dinnerware with pictures of the family. So at this point, before the war, all of this, uh, some of this was happening and it was in the cause of the anti-slavery movement. After the war, it was because these characters had become endeared to the public, just like Dickens's characters were so well known uh, throughout the 19th century. Uh, you know, Mr. Pickwick and uh, little Nell of the old curiosity shop. I mean, just like Uncle Tom's Cabin, these these names were very familiar to the average American at the time, and there was a whole kind of commercial culture uh, based on it. Dramatic, pictorial, um, and um, so, uh, and that kind of, that served to fade away in the beginning of the 20th century, but it was still going strong throughout uh, the 19th. And then the sales of her book kind of dipped a bit um, after World War I, and she was kind of in bad repute for a little while in the 1930s and 40s. And black writers were attacking her, like James Baldwin wrote a famous essay um, saying that, uh, you know, complaining about the racial stereotypes. And mm. there was a book uh, by a white academic called Goodbye to Uncle Tom in uh, the 18th, I'm sorry, the 1950s. And then suddenly, um, Edmund Wilson, the uh, American literary critic, wrote an essay that really pointed out, went back to Uncle Tom's Cabin and, and recognized its literary values. And then uh, after that, academics started rereading the book and realized just how important it was and how, it, you know, it was quite a accomplished literary uh, creation. So now, uh, within the last 40 years, there have been just a ton of articles and whole books written about Uncle Tom's Cabin and Stowe as a writer. So she's really come back uh, in uh, with a vengeance uh, into uh, academia. I don't think the public knows that much about her, but um. well, they, well, they ought to, and that's you know, and that's that's the perhaps on the spot question that I would ask is, you know, how you think this applies to our everyday lives today and the social causes that we get involved in. I think the thing that was really that really resonated with me is, I think it was very illuminating for me to understand the current state of American race relations. I think this gave me an aperture into that, you know, where we are today and how much further we have to go. And Uncle Tom's Cabin was, you know, I think it explained a lot about where we are and how much more we have to do to improve that situation. Yeah. But then, but then also, you know, without getting into too many too controversial things, I mean, you, you really, I think it, I think it, it really causes a lot of contemplation to think about who is the most vulnerable amongst us and are we doing enough or do we feel there's a sense of helplessness to that? Uh, you know, so that's, that's for me. Okay. And I understand that that's not going to be a view shared by many. <laughs> um, but what about for you? Uh, I, um, yeah, when I, you were talking, I was thinking about the last chapter there where she quotes, uh, um, I think it's Micah, the prominent Micah, and, uh, says, uh, that if you don't get rid of this moral outrage, then you will be punished yeah. as a nation, right? So, um, I really identify with Stowe's moral fervor, uh, mainly about the institution of slavery as a as an evil institution that is just a crying um, example of uh, 
you know, systematic dehumanization and a failure to recognize the unity of this of the human race because right. you know, slavery of course is based on um, scientific racialism that would believe that you know African Americans were like a separate species or something. Yeah, so it's, a, it's like a proto eugenics program. Yeah, yeah. So uh, that is what I, I strongly I, I, I admire Stowe for being so fervid in her passion against slavery. But of course, uh, I mean, if you don't accept her Christian moral compass, then you know, a lot of this really doesn't really have that much impact on you. Um, and in fact, Stowe herself, uh, after the Civil War, she, <clears throat> she kind of pissed off a lot of people because she, she wrote fictions that sort of attacked women going out of the home and having more of a, a sort of professional life. Uh, so she was involved in the, uh, she was sort of an anti-feminist uh, in the 1870s. Um, I mean, even though she was admired, she was revered by a lot of people for her role in uh, helping uh, precipitate uh, the movement to end slavery. Um, she wasn't always championing you know what everyone could agree is the right causes um, well we can't anyway. all we can't all be perfect given where no. we are in the historical no. timeline you know there are things that you know there are things that you and i champion right now and there are other things that you and i are neglecting um and his, and, his, and we may think that we're championing all the right stuff right now yeah. but history may not be that kind to us so I tend None to be a little bit. I tend to be charitable with figures like this because yeah. the same thing can be applied to you and me. Well, she she wrote, um, you know, this novel Dread in 1856, I think it is, which is another anti-slavery book that really gets almost no attention from the public, but academia has has sort of woken up to it. It's not nearly as powerful as Uncle Tom's Cabin, but it is quite a good read, and it takes a little more of a radical stance about uh, slaves taking up arms to defend themselves because Uncle Tom's Cabin, the one thing you don't see is slaves saying, we're going to go out and fight a war to liberate ourselves, right? We, well, yeah, that, that, was uh, a, that was like one of the justifications for keeping slavery is that there weren't insurrections during the Civil War and that they, that that I think the Confederates with some success, if I under, you're the historian, so I'll defer to you, they, they were actually able to conscript Negro troops in some instances. Yeah, well, that happened mainly towards the end of the war, and they were promising them the, their freedom, but it was a sign of oh. desperation. Oh, okay. Absolute desperation, yeah. yeah. Um, but yeah, so, like, like, so you had all these guys going to the front lines, and you know the slaves were on the homestead. It would have been a perfect <laughs> opportunity for their yeah. insurrection. Well... Yeah, I don't. I don't really know much uh, that much about that. Yeah. Um, well, that's that's just that was some of the critical commentary yeah. that I heard from people who did not like Uncle Tom's Cabin. They're like, "See how docile they were? They yeah. wouldn't touch. They wouldn't harm a fly while right. we were away fighting the Civil War." And I was just yeah. like, "Oh my God!" Yeah, it's it's <laughs> yeah. So anywho, well, I thought this was a. a a really invigorating conversation, and I hope people really enjoyed this. Is there anything else you'd like to say in closing? Uh, no, I think we covered a lot here. Yeah, I think so too. I'm really glad you selected this text. It was quite the yeah. education for me. And uh, to be honest, I, I, you know, we cover a lot of stuff on Noetic. We try to provide a lot of educational materials, but I, I think, I think, in my estimation, Uncle Tom's Cabin has to be a priority for any feeling and thinking person. It's, it's that important. I really, yeah. I really do think it's that important. So, and like I said, I think it will allow you to see with new eyes uh, current trends that are going on within our culture. So, I, I yeah. you know, right. may, maybe it will empower individuals. Maybe it will, uh, uh, wherever there is moral torpidity, maybe it may actually uh, cause some of that that righteous fervor to come yeah. back. So we'll see. Uh, teach them a lot of history, American history as well. Yes, most definitely. Most definitely. I got so much of an education from this book on so many different levels. All right. Thank you, Dr. Cook. Uh, we'll, we'll conference a little bit about when we'll get together again, and uh, we'll be back with a new edition probably in, a, I don't know, a month to six weeks. All right. Take care. Okay. We'll Bye. see you.